Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susan King. I'm your visiting minister today, and uh, I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, I don't know if you're all members of St. John's or if we have any visitors, but uh, I want to remind you that no matter who you are or where you are and what life's journey, you are welcome here. We do have an announcement. If there are no more announcements, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Will you please stand and join me in the call to worship? The voice of God proclaims of Jesus, You are my beloved, and I love you. We too are God's beloved children, loved and embraced. With all the voices reminding us that we are not enough or don't belong, it is tempting to forget our place in God's kingdom. 
with waters of baptism and the voices of God's promises, we can face the temptation in the wilderness or desert that would draw us away from the source of our hope. Embrace your belovedness. We rejoice in God's unending love for us. Please join me in the opening prayer. How you love us, God of rainbow promises, lead us through the wilderness that surround our lives. Decrease our fears and increase our faith as we embark on this Lenten journey. Amen. turns them into vows of faithfulness. God takes our biggest feelings and shapes lives of service. God listens to our prayers of confession and changes them into songs of mercy. Let us come to the one who pours forgiveness in our, to our lives, praying, we admit we are hesitant to walk to Jerusalem and beyond with you. God of glory. In a world where we worry about tomorrow before enjoying today, we race by your moments of silence, of learning. In that flood of worries which can overwhelm us, we may miss that assurance that you have not cut us off from your grace. In the deserts of our desires, we may ignore that feast of hope, of joy, of life you offer to us. Forgive us and have mercy on us, gentle guardian of our souls. In humility, may we offer our lives to others. In love, may we share your grace with everyone we meet. In hope, may we wait for you all our days as you come to us in the life and joy of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Praise be to God, whose forgiveness and steadfast love endures forever. Praise God.
Would all the children come forward and join me? you guys good well today sadly because of the every year that typical snowstorm that pops up right there in the middle of uh, end of February out of nowhere I wasn't able to get some science stuff from school right but I was able to make do with some stuff that really isn't useful anymore. I don't, and I, you guys don't even know what this, they don't know what this is here. Now, some of you might be like, well, that looks like a Bible. That looks like a Bible and a Bible cover. Well, I said this isn't useful anymore. So that wouldn't be true, right? You guys know what this is? You ready? Don, I don't think you had one of these in your car either. I think there's a sweet spot of an age range for this. Don, did you ever end up having a giant binder of CDs sitting in your car back in the day? With the mix tapes, with the mix CDs? Yeah, you guys know it? You guys CDs? Go ahead and flip through those. Have you seen CDs before? Yeah. Oh, you have CDs about videos, the DVDs. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, there's tons of stuff, you know, nice, you know, Bob Marley and Bob Dylan right next to each other right there. Huh. Wow. Quite a selection there. And then you'd make mix CDs, you know, for friends and stuff to, you know, let them know how much, you know, you cared about them or, you know, if you had a road trip. You make CDs. So today, have you ever made promises with friends? How do, how do you guys symbolize a promise with a friend? Tyler, gosh. Every time I go right to you and you give me the answer I'm looking for, right? You do the little pinky promise, right? Well, guess what? God makes pinky promises with us too. And we're going to, we're going to hope that this works here. Um, it's a lot easier to do this with a prism or some other things that, uh, but we're going to see here if we can see with this CD, how God makes promises, pinky promises with us. And you can wish on a star rainbow and your dreams will come true. You know what? And uh, and you know what? And you could say prayers to God on a star rainbow too. And and I'm sure that he will uh, answer your prayers with a yes, no, maybe, or wait. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, dreams can be all types of dreams, right? Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and say a quick prayer about promises. And uh, then you guys can go downstairs and learn about Lent and counting down to Easter. All right, you guys ready? Go ahead and repeat after me. 
Dear God, thank you for making promises. I know that sometimes the answer is yes. Or no, or maybe. With our dreams and prayers. Thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right, go ahead and head back, guys. Today's scripture comes from Genesis 9, 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and and your every descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall I, never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Now, if we'd ask those young people that were gathered here just a moment ago what their favorite Bible story was, I bet at least one of them would say Noah's Ark, right? Uh, Noah's Ark is an especially popular Bible story for children. You can find lots of children's books about Noah and the Ark, nursery decorations and toys, all from this story. It is especially loved by children because of all the animals, and children love animals of all kinds. And the idea of animals being rescued, we like that part of the story. But I'm not sure this story is suitable for children after all, because what the animals and the people needed to be rescued from is quite literally, according to the Bible text, an act of God. It's not just that the animals and Noah's family need to be saved from any old natural disaster. It's a flood that God has sent to clear the land of wickedness. And the flip side to the comforting idea that Noah and his family and two of every kind of animal is saved is that all the rest of the people and animals are not saved. They are destroyed. Is this a proper story for children, a proper lesson for children? 
If you are bad, God will kill you. One of the members of my former church told me that she had been reading the Bible every day for two years. Try that, reading the Bible every day for two years. And she said after reading much of the Old Testament, she was starting to feel like she didn't like the Bible very much. All of those Old Testament stories about God killing people or causing people to be killed for all sorts of infractions, some seemingly minor, and all those sacrifices, all those animals being killed and the blood spattered everywhere, such stories inevitably lead us to the question, is God violent? The problem with the Noah's Ark story and the other violent stories in the Bible is it calls us to question how we read the Bible and how the Bible is God's word for us. How do we read these violent stories in the, about God if we believe God is good and loving and forgiving? Was God violent at one time in ancient times, but renounced violence and became loving and forgiving? There are many different ways to understand how the Bible is the word of God. On one extreme is the Bible is literally God's word, dictated word by word to those who wrote it down. And at the other extreme is that the Bible is simply human words about God. And I think all of us probably fall somewhere in the middle there. This is important when thinking and talking about the character of God. For example, if a story in the Bible portrays, portrays God acting in a violent way, must we believe that God is violent? Some interpret these stories to mean that God was violent at one time, but has changed. The passage we have for today leads out, leaves out all the messy parts of the story of Noah. It leaves out the mocking that Noah received at the hands of his neighbors. It leaves out the hard labor of building the ark. It leaves out all the mess and hassle with all those animals. Our passage today starts with a promise. God making a promise to Noah and his descendants. In other words, to all of humanity from this point on, this is an important point, I think. God is not saying that the covenant is just for Noah and his family. No, the God, God says the covenant is for everyone. And not just people either. No, God says this covenant is with the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth. This covenant is not just with humanity, but with every living creature. And what is the promise? The promise is never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And here's the really interesting part to me. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between you and me and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the heavens, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. What kind of bow is God setting in the heavens? We're not talking about a bow of bright colors stretched across the sky. We are talking about a war bow. This is talking about God setting God's war bow in the sky and making a promise to study war no more. If that sounds far-fetched, we need to realize that's how many people, if not most people, in, understood God in those days as a divine warrior. Uh, remember, we call God the God of hosts. Well, those hosts are the hosts of an army. Some of the most difficult stories for us in the Bible to understand are stories where God is described as a divine warrior, calling for the destruction of enemies and the slaughtering of men, women, and children. So this is something quite remarkable, the warrior God renouncing war. 
What is the purpose for the bow in the sky that causes us such wonder and delight? Wasn't it just fun to see the window, the, the prism, the uh, rainbow on the wall? The rainbow always gives us a feeling of hope and cheerfulness. It's a sign, a symbol, a reminder of the covenant. A reminder not primarily for human beings, but according to the Bible story, a reminder for God. To help God remember a promise that God has made. The promise that God would never again destroy the earth is comforting, but it doesn't address the detail that God did wipe them out once. Some people try to explain away the violence in the story of Noah by pointing out that God is our heavenly father and as such is supposed to discipline his children. But we don't discipline our children by killing them. As for renouncing war and violence, to believe that literally we would have to ignore most of the rest of the Old Testament. When we try to take the Bible too literally, it is hard for us to take it seriously because it would force us to believe in a God who is angry, vengeful, and violent. Some people point to the Noah story as a sign that God has changed over time. This might be a shocking idea to those of us who are raised on the idea that God is eternally unchanging. For the story of Noah and the ark, the story of the covenant, of peace, the covenant of the rainbow seems to suggest that either God has changed and matured over time, or that human understanding of God has changed over time. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is this simply a story that is meant to teach us and not a recording of an actual historical event. I find it interesting that many cultures of the world have an ancient story of a worldwide flood. One of the most famous is called the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh which comes from ancient Mesopotamia. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the gods get angry with people and decide to send a flood to punish them. One of the gods instructs a man to build a large boat. And then it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. Sound at all familiar? Did you know there's a place in Kentucky called the Ark Encounter, where they have built a life-size model of Noah's Ark according to the description in the Bible. It is 510 feet long 85 feet wide and 51 feet high. You can go and tour it. And some people think that they have found the actual ark petrified into stone at the top of Mount Ararat in Turkey. It's all very interesting, but it seems to me that the most important start part of the story is not the animals, it's not the ark itself, or even the flood, but the promise. The covenant, which is a covenant of peace. The covenant that God establishes between himself and humanity and all future generations is distinctive in several ways. It is made between God and all living creatures in perpetuity, not just with the people of Israel, it includes all creatures of the earth, not just human beings. And most dramatically of all, God is the only one that speaks and makes promises in this covenant. Did you notice that? There are many covenants in the Bible, of course. The covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with David. The whole idea of covenant between God and human beings runs throughout Christianity and Judaism. Jesus was well familiar with the importance of covenant. And in the words of the Gospel of John, we find Jesus saying at the Last Supper, this is the covenant in my blood shed for you and for many for forgiveness of sin. All of these covenants 
at heart are about the same thing, God promising to love us, care for us, be with us no matter what. And there are some promises of the blessings that will come to us if we live the way God desires. And there are some warnings about the consequences of not following God's ways. But like any loving parent, no matter how many times we go our own headstrong way, God always longs for us to come home again. God always welcomes us back. And covenant is not just something between God and humanity. Covenant is a big part of church life. When we baptize someone, whether an infant or an older person, a child, a young adult, we covenant, we pledge, we promise to be there for them on their faith journey, offering support and companionship. When a person joins a church, they pledge and promise to support the church and the church pledges and promises to support them. We covenant and promise to support one another through hard times and celebrate with one another in joyful times. Covenant is what keeps a church together. You're about to make a covenant with your new pastor who will be coming here in a few weeks. It's a long process to look for a pastor and a joyous one to welcome a new pastor into the ministry of your church. This is a time of new beginning, a time of a, like a rainbow after a long rain. A pastor named Kathy Rains put it this way, we are made in God's image. God is choosing in this story to limit God's use of power in the future. The rainbow is a reminder to God of God's intention for the future, but also a challenge to us humans who are made in God's image to limit our use of power and destruction. Our shedding of blood only leads to more human bloodshed. God chose to limit God's self and God's power even to the ultimate limit, Jesus' death on the cross rather than saving his own skin. I like that notion that this story is about God choosing to limit God's own destructive power. It matters what we believe about God's use of power. It matters if our image of God is that of a violent warrior king or a loving parent begging us to come home. Every time I see the bombing in Gaza, I am reminded of stories throughout the Hebrew scriptures where God has told the Israelites to invade a town and kill all of the people and take the land that God is giving them. If you believe that God instructed the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites, is it that far a stretch to believe that God approves of wiping out the Palestinians? Yes, it matters what our image of God is. If God chooses to limit God's power of destruction, that is the sign, the promise of the rainbow, then must we also hang up our war bows and limit the use of our power and our destructive capability? The story of the covenant of peace is the Old Testament story for the first Sunday of Lent for year B. I'm not sure why, but this year of the lectionary, every week of Lent has an Old Testament story of covenant. That covenant, especially the covenant of peace, is the place from which we begin our journey of faith, walking with Jesus to the cross. Amen. Thank you.
You may be seated. It is time to enter into a time of prayer, lifting up our joys and our concerns. Gracious God, it is so good to be able to come to you in prayer as a community of faith, uniting our hearts and our spirits with you and your good intentions for all of creation. We pray, O oh God, for all who are in need of healing of body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those who are nearing the end of their life on this earth, that they might pass into your eternal care with dignity and peace. And we pray for all who are mourning the loss of loved one. We pray for the fam children of our families, of our church, of our community, of our world, that they might receive the care and nurture they need to grow and thrive, that they might be safe in their homes and in their schools, and when they gather for parades, that they might be safe and free from harm and fear. We pray for your peace in our hearts and homes, in our neighborhoods and schools, peace in our nation, peace in our world. We especially remember the people of Israel and Gaza and the people of Russia and the Ukraine. We lift up these prayers and the secret prayers of our hearts in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the whole world forever. Amen. There are many ways that we give to support the church. We give of our time and talent, and we give of our treasure. Uh, we support the church financially in so many different ways. Some give here in part of worship, some give online. Uh, this is our time of offering our gifts to God. We dedicate all the gifts that we offer for the ministry and mission of Christ Church. Let us pray together. Abundant God, receive these gifts of love from your servants and use them for the breaking in of your kingdom of love and life. In the name of Jesus, whose way calls us forth in service, we pray. Amen.
friends, may God's grace go with you as we enter this season of Lent, that we might draw closer to you and feel your presence among us. Go now in peace. Go now in peace, and may the love of God surround you everywhere you go. Amen.